Welcome everyone to Washington SoilCon 2024. I'm Gabriel Hugh, an assistant professor of soil science, and I'm so excited to be here for SoilCon Global Perspectives, where we are gonna dive into soil health projects from across the world. This is our fourth year of SoilCon, and while it may look different this year, we hope you can find this one of the best ways to attend. Today, we have a wonderful set of speakers and topics to discuss. But first, we wanna thank our sponsors, the Washington State Conservation Commission, and the USDA NRCS. With their support, we are able to bring you this event and provide regional events across Washington. Second, SoilCon organizers would like to thank all the speakers who are contributing to the event over the next few days for making time in their busy schedules. Before we get started, let's cover a few logistical details. First, you might be watching this from the Zoom event lobby right now. You will know that if you see the lobby chat on the right side of your screen. You can continue watching from there, but to ask questions and participate in the session chat, you will also need to click the Join Session button where, below where you are seeing this stream. Second, there will be resources available to you during each of the talks today. You will see a small icon in the lower right-hand corner of the Zoom screen. Click it to find resources. You can also access the resources afterward by clicking the resources button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Each speaker will have time for questions at the end of their talk. If you have a question for any of the speakers, please post them in the Q&A at the bottom of the Zoom screen. You can also upvote if somebody has already asked your question and those will, questions will be prioritized. If you have a technical issue at any point, please post that in the chat. Organizers will reach out to you via email to help. All presentations will be recorded for future viewing here in the Zoom event or on the Washington Soil Health Initiative YouTube channel. As an attendee, we ask that you answer a short one question survey after each presentation and answering after each presentation will increase your chances of winning some Washington Soil Health Initiative swag. During the break and anytime after the event, Please feel free to network with others by visiting the attendees tab in the lobby to check out resources and programs from the sponsors and exhibitors using the exhibitor tab. We are very excited to have you all attend. Please let SoilCon Global Perspectives begin. I'm excited to introduce our first speaker to you, Dr. Danny Gilardi. Danny Gilardi leads the soil and climate efforts for the Washington State Department of Agriculture, including the Washington Soil Health Initiative. Today, she will be talking about moving towards science-informed, grower-centric policies. And just so you know, more information on each speaker can be found under the speaker tab in the lobby. So Danny, thank you for presenting and please take it away. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for the introduction, Gabe. Um, as Gabe mentioned, I'm Danny, the Senior Soil Scientist and Climate Coordinator at WSDA, which is the Washington State Department of Agriculture. And I am excited to be here today to discuss our work in Washington State and how we attempt to build both scientifically credible and agronomically feasible programs and policies to sequester soil carbon, but more importantly, to promote soil health. And as a quick note, a lot of what I'm talking about today will be referenced in QR codes and links at the bottom of the page. So feel free to scan as I talk or wait until Molly, Molly McElwam sends the resource roundup at the end of the conference. So before we get started about policies and programs, I just want to define a few terms and make sure we're all on the same page. So let's talk about how carbon gets in the soil. Plants use atmospheric carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. And they convert that gaseous carbon into sugars that are stored in their bodies or exuded through their roots into the soil. Then soil microbes use that carbon in leaves and plants and, and other dead micro or macrofauna manure compost as a substrate for metabolism and population, gro population growth. And so most of the carbon in those organic inputs is actually converted back into CO2 um, as microbes respire that carbon, while about three to 33% is retained in soil organic matter or in microbial bodies. And so sometimes soil carbon and soil organic matter are used interchangeably, but it's important to remember that soil organic matter is actually made of about 58% 
carbon. And the rest of soil organic matter is other elements, including essential plant nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And just a few other terms, I want to define the difference between sequestration and storage. So the biophysical process by which carbon is drawn down uh, through plants, processed by microbes and added to the soil is called soil carbon sequestration. And you may have heard a lot about that in the news or in various farming communities. The amount sequestered minus the amount lost is what is called soil carbon storage. And that's really what we're looking to increase through our farming practices. If you zoom in a little bit, another way to look at the carbon cycle is to think about soil microbes like a little factory that both charge and draw power from a soil organic matter battery. And the charging process, as we described, is called carbon sequestration. And then um, the mineralization process is how microbes utilize soil organic matter for various ecosystem services. Here we see a lot of those ecosystem services, things like water supply, nutrient cycling, and pest and disease suppression. And in order for these services to be provided, microbes must use the soil organic matter. And in the process, much of that carbon is released back into CO2. So it's always good to think about carbon storage and sequestration and mineralization in terms of a big cycle. So hopefully I haven't already lost you. I could talk about the complexities and nuances of soil carbon for a very, very long time. Um, but unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for all of you, I only have 20 minutes. So let's quickly go over the highlight reel to explain why it is so challenging to increase soil carbon and to measure those increases. First and foremost, soils are diverse. That's our tagline at the Washington Soil Health Initiative, diverse soils, uh, diverse solutions for diverse soils. There are over 20,000 soil series in the United States, which means that even within a single field, there will be multiple and each will have different inherent capacities to store carbon. Variables like texture and mineralogy are hugely important where say a fine textured soil may be able to store more carbon than a sandy soil. And that means it's hard to prescribe a single practice like cover cropping, for example, and expect a single soil carbon result in all fields. Also, storage is not built linearly. There's this concept of soil carbon saturation, where even if you keep putting carbon in your soils and using carbon farming practices, soil carbon increases may plateau. And instead, your additional work may be processed by microbes and respired back out as CO2. This is in part because of the soil diversity I mentioned earlier, but also because stoichiometry matters. You may recall from your high school chemistry lessons where you learned that even if you have enough bread to make three ham sandwiches, you can't always make three ham sandwiches because there are other limiting ingredients. Soil organic matter is similar. Carbon is only one essential ingredient to the SOM sandwich, alongside which you need other ingredients like nitrogen and phosphorus and sulfur. So again, you could add carbon, but if the other ingredients aren't there, you may not store it for a considerable length of time as soil organic matter. And finally, we know that increases in soil carbon are not necessarily permanent. You could spend a lot of time and energy for many years building your soil organic matter, only to have those gains reversed in a few seasons of intensive management or because of totally unforeseen circumstances like extreme heat or a well going dry. So you can see that uh, it may be tough to universally predict the impact of regenerative agricultural practices on soil carbon. These five soil health principles have a very good chance of increasing it, but that outcome is not guaranteed and it will not be achieved universally in all conditions. The impact of management is uncertain, to say nothing of the many other economic, cultural, and educational barriers. It's one of the reasons we call it so the Washington Soil Health Initiative and not the Washington Soil Carbon Initiative. Because even when these practices don't increase carbon, they can provide other essential ecosystem services that should never be ignored when we are talking about soil health. Soils are incredibly important for water storage and filtration and for providing biodiversity habitat for macro and microflora and fauna. And so 
with all of the complexities of soil carbon, you can imagine that it's pretty challenging to build programs and policies around protecting and increasing it. Here's a sort of course breakdown of the various ways we could spend public and private investments in soil carbon. The big first division is economics versus information, where um, you can see there are still many, many other uh, subdivisions. On the economic side, there are both regulatory and voluntary approaches. And within voluntary approaches, there are pay for practice approaches, where you simply help a producer implement a practice, whether or not the outcome of increased soil carbon or soil health is guaranteed. Uh, an example of this is the NRCS EQIP program, or you can pay for performance, where you don't issue any money until the carbon has actually increased in your soil. An example of this are voluntary carbon markets. Then there's the whole information side, where you can invest in public education around soil carbon, soil carbon research, and the provision of technical assistance. So this brings me to the Washington Soil Health Initiative, which was passed into law as a tri-agency partnership in 2019. WASHI, as we lovingly call it, is made up of the Washington Conservation Commission, who represents the 45 conservation districts across the state, the Department of Agriculture, where I work, and Washington State University. And together, we work towards improved soil health, both on the economic development and the provision of information in all its forms. Our theory of change is that science should inform policy, which should support practice, which in turn should improve science. And for this to be successful, the collaboration of many diverse stakeholders is required because as we described, soils are complex. It is an all hands on deck situation. And so while WASHI is a formal partnership between government actors and researchers, we have public interest groups, industry groups, and most importantly, growers as part of all of our decision making processes from who we engage for our state soil health roadmap to who serves on our various advisory committees. With all of those hands on deck, there is a lot of power to affect real change but no one strategy will work in isolation. For example, incentive payments are a great way to help a producer implement a new practice, but we also need to work on market-based economic development. So there's a sort of continued financial incentive even after grant payments are complete. Like microbial communities or crop rotations, the best, most resilient policy portfolio is one with many diverse strategies. And I'm going to spend the rest of the talk showcasing some of what we have going on in Washington and why we believe it supports our theory of change. So we all know that regulations are one very effective way to catalyze behavior change when you make something, somebody do something. Uh, but the challenge with regulations is that even farmers who stay in compliance incur enormous costs. In California, a recent study showed that the regulatory burden on producers increased 265% in six years across all crops studied. And some of these regulations were about worker safety and, and food safety, but many are related to some of the same goals we have in the climate smart agricultural community, cleaner air, cleaner water, and the judicious use of inputs. These are essential outcomes to work towards, but we want to see them achieved in the context of a viable and vital agricultural system where um, agricultural goals and environmental goals are not in competition with one another, but in fact, one and the same. And so I challenge decision makers in the room to think creatively about ways to avoid regulation and instead encourage the voluntary adoption of best management practices. In Washington, we have something called the Voluntary Stewardship Program, which allows counties to opt out of a series of state regulations if they agree to create, implement, and monitor the impacts of local stewardship plans. And to date, 27 counties have joined VSP to develop voluntary strategies to protect wildlife habitats, wetlands, groundwater aquifers, and erosion-prone areas. This both localizes action, but it takes the burden off of individual producers and instead allows public entities to coordinate and catalyze behavior change. At the Washington Soil Health Initiative, we advocate for the voluntary adoption of conservation practices wherever possible. So let's start uh, over in that sort of decision tree uh, about talking about pay for practice programs, and in particular, carbon markets. Uh, 
Many of you may have noticed that carbon markets are a bit controversial, um, and I intend encourage everyone to attend the February 20th SoilCon event to learn more. I won't go over all the challenges, um, but instead just describe a couple of things we think about in Washington. As I described, it's really, really hard to know if your practices are going to or already did increase soil carbon. And this creates challenges when soil carbon is being used to offset other emission sources. For example, if a factory continues to emit greenhouse gases or, or maybe even increases greenhouse gases in exchange for paying a farmer to sequester carbon when that outcome is not guaranteed. This can lead to a net increase in greenhouse gases or social inequities by just moving pollution from one neighborhood to another. A group called Carbon Plan recently reviewed the 17 most common soil carbon offset protocols to determine that over half of them scored only one out of five in terms of their scientific rigor, their additionality, permanence of the carbon they're storing, and safeguards for growers. And again, these low quality standards can have real environmental and social consequences. One approach, uh, one alternative approach that's been adopted in public markets, like those in California and Washington, offers a, a viable alternative solution. So in these markets, soil carbon is not an eligible offset. A factory cannot trade their emissions for new farming practices. Instead, factories have to purchase the right to emit greenhouse gas emissions from the state at a decreasing rate every year. And then the revenue from those purchases are invested in environmental justice and climate smart practices all across the state. In Washington, this cap and invest uh, market funds many programs that are likely to increase soil carbon, even if it's not guaranteed, which means that soil carbon is not on the hook for climate change mitigation, but is nonetheless significantly invested in as part of a larger, more holistic strategy. This kind of public investment in climate smart agriculture is essential. There is more pressure on farmers than ever to provide services in addition to their primary role of producing food. We want farmers to help us clean up the air, clean up the water, and mitigate climate change. And these are benefits that will be shared by everyone, but it's often the farmer that bears the cost. In Washington, we surveyed dryland wheat producers about their conservation practices to find that about 72% practice reduced or no-till, which was really impressive and we're very excited about that. Um, of those producers, however, almost 80% said that costs are a major challenge to maintaining that practice. And of the 28% who conventionally till, 100% cited costs as the reason why. And when you drill into where those costs are incurred, you find that the equipment required to reduce tillage can cost producers well over $1 million each. And federal incentive programs often do not have financial incentives for equipment. So the Conservation Commission here in Washington State has launched a program called Sustainable Farms and Fields that provides grants in several different categories, including equipment sharing and purchases. Since the program launched, for example, they have provided no-till no drills and GPS units for individual producers, as well as to conservation districts for their equipment rental programs. They also fund research demonstrations and the provision of technical assistance. Since 2023, 3.1 million has gone to fund 73 climate smart projects. And uh, the Conservation Commission expects to allocate an additional 4.2 million over the next six months. This is work funded by the state legislature, as well as that cap and invest market I described earlier. We've also recently launched a program called Saving Tomorrow's Agriculture Resources. You'll hear a lot more about this at 1115 today, but essentially this free and voluntary program allows producers who practice good stewardship to brag about their work through branding initiatives. And the goal is to generate a market signal for conservation practices so that consumers and supply chain partners will pay for products grown with climate smart practices. This market-based incentive approach helps producers sustain their practices practices, even after a grant payment has run out. It's also important to remember that there are other pieces required to incentivize behavior change. In our survey, we found that an overwhelming 97% of dryland wheat producers do not cover crop. However, the few who do cover crop did not report having to buy new equipment, and almost all of them received cost share for the cover crop seed. 
Instead, lack of knowledge was the bigger barrier. Producers reported that they did not know how to use cover crop seed in their specific location, given precipitation and climate limitations and restrictions from their crop insurance. And so it's not enough just to provide economic development. In Washington, we spend an enormous amount of time providing workshops, webinars. Of course, you're all here today at SoilCon um, and attempting to foster peer-to-peer -peer learning. All three of the programs I mentioned earlier, Sustainable Farms and Fields, STAR, and Voluntary Stewardship Program have a technical assistance component to ensure that producers can transition their practices uh, with as much support as possible. As part of the WASHI technical support infrastructure, we've also built a new resource locator that you can get to by scanning this circular QR code or by visiting the WASHI website. And here you can find online materials, someone local to help, financial, financial support, or climate smart equipment. There's also a lot of evidence to show that growers learn best from one another rather than from university or government officials. And with that in mind, we have launched the Soil Health Ambassador Program, where producers who have successfully implemented conservation practices are provided a small stipend for their willingness to talk with other growers about their successes and challenges. The program is just beginning, but the hope is that eventually we have local ambassadors in every county and every cropping system who speak multiple languages. And you'll be hearing more about uh, one of our soil health ambassadors later today at 1145. And finally, as a soil scientist, I would be remiss not to mention how essential it is to have local place-based research. At the Washington Soil Health Initiative, we have invested in a series of long-term research sites, or LTERs, where we measure the impacts of different conservation practices on soil health, farm profitability, and climate change in different crops in perpetuity. You'll hear a lot more about the LTER research throughout this month of SoilCon, um, but one other project I want to mention is we also have something called the State of the Soils Assessment. And to date, we've taken nearly 1,000 soil samples in uh, across Washington crop types to assess baseline soil health, to link soil health indicators with management practices, and to develop decision support tools for farmers so that they can measure and improve their own soil health. As part of this project, we've also trained nearly 80 technical assistance providers on how to soil sample and how to interpret soil sample results, and provided almost 300 producers with customized soil health reports. So to bring this all full circle, yes, Soil carbon is complex and soil carbon program and policy making is also complex, but it's important to remember that it's complexity that drives resilience. In Washington, we are trying to have as many stakeholders work on as many projects as it takes to protect our soils equitably, responsibly, and in perpetuity. And so we always like to encourage people not to miss the forest for the trees or the soils for the soil carbon, and instead think about how these practices can build resilience through a changing climate and help producers and society adapt to climate change, even in cases where they don't mitigate climate change. And to remember that the many co-benefits uh, that soil health can provide are incredibly important beyond just carbon. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you so much, Danny, for that talk. That was a great way to start us off. Um, for a reminder for the attendees to this, um, there is a one question short poll. So if you could please answer that. Folks who answer the poll uh, are gonna have a better chance of winning Washington Soil Health Initiative swag. So Danny, we really appreciate you starting us off that way. Um, a great overview and um, connecting to the policy perspectives. and so. Uh, um, one thing I was wondering about is I really like your idea of this microbial factory, uh, the battery recharge um, that you presented in that paper, because something that I sometimes hear from farmers is this idea of, you know, they want to be able to use the soil organic matter. They want to be able to take advantage of these benefits, just like you were saying that, you know, that use or that microbial processing is really necessary for soil structure and all these other functions. And so I was just uh, wondering if you could um, talk a little bit more about either the trade-offs or the synergies associated with this idea of soil carbon sequestration 
um, but also using the soil organic matter to get these co-benefits? That's a great question. I, I think to go back to um, when I talked about regulatory approaches, I think what we're trying to do is encourage environmental stewardship, but in the context of an agriculturally viable and vital landscape. And I think, you know, you could retire all agricultural lands and put them under perennial plantings and perhaps sequester more carbon. But the truth is we need to feed the world. And if you retire lands in one area, there's a very good chance that something else somewhere else will be brought into production. There's a lot of research that shows bringing native prairie or forest lands under agricultural production is sort of where you get that first and massive initial soil carbon loss. And so I, I think, of course, there are trade-offs, but um, retiring agriculture is not a solution. The solution is, of course, to work towards environmental stewardship in the context of food production. And I think there are a lot of strategies to do that. I think um, probably at each of the individual soil con events, We'll talk more about conservation practices and their impacts. Um, but yeah, I think, of course, there are trade-offs, but they are not, uh, the goals are not mutually exclusive. Great. And I'm seeing some other questions come in. Um, one other one I wanted to ask is I, I really enjoyed the um, slide on the regulatory burden of uh, farmers in California. And I, I, I wasn't entirely sure, but I, I was guessing most of those were coming from government regulations. And I wonder, do you have any perspective on the role of, say, uh, private industry buyers, you know, some of these bigger mm -hmm. um, national entities and the uh, kind of um, caveats or restrictions they might place on the producers and whether those are part of that regulatory burden or whether producers view those more separately? The study I showed was about government regulations. And I think um, in some ways you could almost put the supply chain requirements that a producer may experience under that voluntary uh, bucket, because of course, if they don't want to sell to a particular producer, uh, purchaser, they could find another avenue. That's not like feasible in many locations and for many reasons. But um, I think the the role the supply chain is playing in driving good stewardship and, and the adoption of conservation practices is actually really exciting. A lot of big companies have made commitments to go net zero by 2030 or 2050. And then um, after the fact are sort of scrambling to figure out how to do that. And so programs like STAR, um, many other programs are great ways to sort of help those companies actually achieve meaningful benefits. That's great, thank you. I'm gonna to go to some questions from the um, uh, chat now from the audience. And so, uh, one that got voted up was you mentioned that lack of knowledge was one factor in the limited use of cover crops in dryland Washington farming, and that crop insurance is also another factor. So thinking about this next round of farm bill negotiations, um, do you know how soil health building practices might be incorporated into um, the farm bill and possibly into the crop insurance? Yeah, I don't work on this topic specifically, so I don't know the very up-to-date um, information on this. But of course, many people probably knew about the pandemic cover crop pilot program. This was a federal program that uh, reduced insurance premiums by $5 per acre if somebody had implemented cover crops. And it doesn't sound like a ton of money, but if you have a lot of acreage, it really adds up. And I know there's a lot of work to make that pilot program more permanent. I think um, the Natural Resource Defense Council is doing quite a lot of work on that, um, both looking at cover crop as a sort of permanently incentivized best management practice through um, crop insurance and also looking at other practices that they may add. Um, but I think if you go to NRDC information, you'll probably find out more current work. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, broadening it out a bit to kind of the many um, environmental issues we face uh, and thinking about nitrogen pollution um, in Washington state specifically, what do you think are some of the most uh, kind of promising or sustainable long-term strategies to help uh, mitigate nitrate runoff issues or, or nitrate leaching issues? 
Yeah, I love talking about nitrogen and I didn't really get to it today, but we're sort of beginning to build an entire nitrogen management program. Um, as a matter of fact, we're hiring an agronomist for anyone in the audience who would like to work on these topics with us. Um, honestly, it's a little bit challenging to talk about because nitrogen management is not just about the agronomics. It's so much about um, sort of culture and behavior and, and risk mitigation to ensure that you get that extra little yield bump, people will apply way more nitrogen they need just in case. And so I think a lot of um, potential is there for building tools that help growers in field make decisions about nitrogen management that also give them the peace of mind that they will indeed uh, have the yields that they're looking for. We are looking to build um, a sort of irrigation and fertilization decision support tool that provides different information about when to fertilize, how much to fertilize based on soil type and, and weather conditions, um, but also provides early warning systems. So for example, if you had scheduled that you were going to irrigate on Monday and then a big storm is expected, that would of course wash away all of your fertilizer, you'll get a little um, alert saying, you know, please don't fertilize that day. Instead, you could wait until Wednesday and have better um, better results. And also, of course, this is about the farmer's bottom line too, because nitrogen is, is not free. And so um, we want to both help them reduce inputs for costs and then also for environmental benefits. So um, yeah, whoever asked that question, come find me. Sounds like you want to be our next agronomist. And to be fair, there, um, there, the questions that we don't have time to get to will still be in the chat. So um, anybody can go take a look at those. And Danny, you're welcome to take a look at those afterwards. I'm going to ask uh, just one more quickly for the sake of time. But um, how can growers become soil health ambassadors in this program you mentioned? It seems really promising. Um, oh, and great. Just a little bit about that. Yeah, so you have to be in Washington State. Um, basically, just email uh, any one of us at, at <laughs> anywhere in the Washington Soil Health Initiative, and we'll get you to the right place. Uh, right now, because the program is new, it was sort of, um, we contacted conservation districts and asked them to recommend someone in their district. We're trying to distribute it across east and west, small and large farms. Um, but we would love to just have a list developed and anytime we can come out and film and talk to you. So um, my email address is here, but you could email Molly, you could email Gabe, any one of us, and we'll get you to the right place. Great. Well, thank you so much, Danny. I apologize. That's all the time we have, but we really appreciate your talk opening this up. And for those that uh, have questions, continue to ask them in the Q&A. We will try and um, get to answering those questions as well. So thanks again, Danny. Yeah, thank you.